Welcome to the Profitable Cleaner Podcast. Join your hosts, James Harper and Angel Sandoval, bringing you the experts, discussions, and knowledge you want. We talk about sales, technology, marketing, operations, strategy, leadership, mindset, health, God, and so much more. Now, are you ready to profit? What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Profitable Cleaner Podcast. I'm your host, James Harper. I am super excited for today's episode. Number one, because we get a roll with my my guy right here, Niles Brightup, and we're going to learn more about Niles. Typically, I do these shows with my co-host, as many of you guys know, Angel Sandoval. It's his birthday today as we record it. So if you're here in this episode, go ahead and wish Angel a, a happy belated birthday by the time you hear this. But anyways, the reason why we are here and why I'm so super excited to uh, have this conversation today is because of, uh, Niles here. So Niles, thanks for joining the show today, brother. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for uh, for having me on. Absolutely, man. So I have to tell you, I'm, if you see me looking away from my screen right now, it's because I'm looking at some notes I have for you and your LinkedIn profile, obviously national account manager for a huge brand in Mar- Marston, but really you come with a lot of years of experience in the facility service services space. In a minute or less, tell us why facility services and give us a little bit about your story and how you got to be to where you're at today. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. So why facility services? So in all honesty, I kind of fell into it. My my dad started a company when I was a young man. Excuse me, I was in high school um, and I needed money. And so I, I started working for him and I, I worked under my older brother and I didn't know it was such a huge industry and, and that there was so much opportunity in it. Um, and so I had to get out of my small town and and join the service and went out and did all that and then ended up getting married and having a family. And I said, holy smokes, what am I going to do to support my family if I don't want to, you know, be traveling so much? And um, so that's really how I just kind of, I fell into it. Uh, When I ended up coming back, I worked for a couple of smaller companies, but some amazing uh, bosses and mentors that showed me how vast this industry is and, and really just how many different kind of nooks and crannies it has in in different areas you can specialize in. Um, And I had some really great opportunity to see a lot of those different, uh, different facets of it. And I've just been really blessed to work for some great companies that have given me some wonderful opportunities. And and not only that, just work with some really awesome teams that, you know, my, the success that I've had throughout my career is not solely mine. Honest to goodness, it's it's been a huge team effort and folks that are out there every day, you know, doing the frontline work and then also doing a lot of the administrative stuff and clerical stuff in the background that help help businesses be successful. I love it, man. It's so funny. I could probably it would almost be a fun exercise for us to go back through all the guests we've had on and when we ask why the janitorial space or facility maintenance, they all say, I didn't mean to, I just fell into it, but I fell in (laughs) love with it. And it sounds very similar to your story. So although that answer is asked often, the, uh, or that question, that answer never fails to surprise me. All right. I'm going to hit you right off the bat, man, because I, something jumped off the page when I was doing some research on you. Um, and, and we're probably going back a little bit in, in your experience, but it says right here, front and center on your LinkedIn profile that you've managed projects um, and portfolios exceeding a hundred million dollars in revenue and managed a $25 million project with Google. Obviously you put the uh, number 25 million in front of it and you put the brand name Google in front of it and you're the manager on it. I'm just going to ask you right off the bat, man, because I'm, I'm selfishly, I'm curious. Tell me about that project. What was it? Give me the nuts and bolts of it. So that was an awesome opportunity. I'd actually, I had started in a different position and as often happens with corporate, uh, you know, big companies, there was some, some movement and I had a a great opportunity to move more into an operation specific role. And that was for kind of the West area. Um, and I had a team, uh, out there, a gentleman named Mauricio Ogarte who ran the site when we were, we were doing about 19 buildings at the time. He was an absolutely amazing 
operator. His team loved him. The customer loved him. So we had we had some really good momentum going. However, they um, put together an RFP for you know a lot of the large companies to come in and and put numbers together to grow with them. And we were successful in putting together a proposal, meeting with a customer, and putting some numbers out there to pick up the lion's share of the buildings within kind of that Mountain View in uh, San Jose, San Francisco type campus area. They're they're kind of spread out throughout there. Um, and so really, it was just, it was growth through the fact that the team on site had an amazing relationship with the customer, but then the pandemic kind of hit, you know, a little prior to that. And so we had an opportunity to step in and really show our expertise and and close a lot of gaps that, you know, everybody was running into at the time, right? Supply chain was almost impossible. Um, but we we had some really forward thinking folks that pulled together some uh, supplies and, and sanitizers, et cetera. A lot of our partners were amazing throughout the time. Um, uh, worked with Waxy and, and a gentleman, uh, Chris, I think it was Chris out at Waxy that helped us pull a lot of that together. And then, um, and then the staffing part that was also just a huge challenge because we were picking up, I, I want to say we picked up another 160, it was 160, 180, something like that employees in a time where finding employees in that area was really tough. Uh, the CBA was being ratified at the time, right? And so there was a lot of the union implications uh, that came into play. Um, so again, I, I had an awesome opportunity to to kind of oversee the the whole project, right? And and interact with our customer and, and do the proposals, et cetera, and do a lot of meetings. But the team on site was 100% instrumental in making that happen. We um, we actually, we did a, a lab cleaning. So we, from ground up, built a lab cleaning protocol for, it started as only a couple of labs and they said it was going to move into about 1500 labs throughout the U.S. Um, and we brought in the, you, I cannot remember the name of the doggone uh, piece of equipment off the top of my head. So as I was saying before, a little bit of jitters in front of the camera, not in front of the camera guys. So, so trying You're to good brother succinct in my answer but um but yeah it was it was such a cool kind of evolution to be a part of and watch from beginning to end um just from coming from the small amount of buildings in and working through some real challenges quite frankly you know there were some which again often happens with large companies uh, uh sometimes there are some gaps that need to be worked through that that aren't necessarily foreseen from the top down right and so it's really getting out there. I've always liked to kind of be a boots on the ground guy with <clears throat> with my teams for a couple of reasons. One, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. Coming into a region as a new leader, there's always an unknown, right? Of, oh my goodness, how's this person going to be? Um, are they going to see the value in what I've done? Speaking obviously from from the site manager's perspective and, and uh, you know, are we going to get the support that we've been requesting for so long? And so I think one of the most important things is getting out there, meeting with the team and showing them that, you know, yeah, you have the support. It, and it doesn't always come in the specific way that you're asking for, right? There, there are other objectives that have to be met from the top down as well. And so it's coming together and finding that understanding. But with the lack of communication and, and lack of um I guess camaraderie for lack of a better term, then then you can't all get on that same page and look to achieve the same mission. And so I think that was a huge part of why we were able to grow and and pick up more business. And and that transcends onto the customer as well, right? The customer sees when you have good morale, when you've got a solid team and folks that are out there looking for not just what's in your SOW, but looking far beyond to to improve life not just for the cleanliness side but just for their end customer their end user also it just turns into a a big um a big happy environment i guess i don't know how else to put it right there's always challenges but um that was that was really the catalyst that kicked us into having the opportunity because at the time we were the smallest of all the contractors on site and we went up against some <laughs> real big names in the industry um and really, I truthfully think it all comes back to that relationship piece that helped us be successful in that. Man, I love that answer because there's a lot to unpack there and we're about to unpack a lot of that. So you said a few different things. So 
you said when dealing with larger accounts, you throughout the proposal process will find a lot of gaps, right? And then obviously you educate on those gaps and then implement, hopefully, to fill in those gaps. Um, I'm curious from a large account perspective, mm -hmm. what are typical gaps that you find and how do you bring that up throughout the proposal process? And like, just break down. I mean, you have such experience dealing with 19 buildings, brand name Google, you know, hundred million dollar portfolio. It's such a different ball game than someone that's bidding on a 15 person day porter job at a manufacturing company, which is still a great deal. Not knocking that, but you're at a whole different level. Talk to us about how you find those gaps, how you navigate the relationship with the client. What's the proposal process look like? Like mm -hmm. someone give us some insight into the world of Marston, the world of the ABMs, which I know you've worked for, and just the strategic analysis that goes in at the level that you're used to working at. Yeah, wow, that's that's a that's a great kind of question. So to try to Step by step. So I guess the first thing when when I've had an opportunity to come into a large book of business, the first thing really, and I know I've said this, but but honestly, this is this is the lion's share of of my successes. I have to understand what's going on with my team. Morale, in my opinion, is the biggest. It, 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 it's either a make or break, right? When because you can only push so long. You can get folks to do what needs to be done when ruling with an iron fist, but quite frankly, it's not sustainable. And you're gonna wash out a lot of really incredible folks that have a whole lot of knowledge, especially if they've been at a specific site for a certain period of time. And then there's the additional fallout, the relationship, et cetera, that they may have had with the customer and so on and so forth. So the first thing that I, that I do really is step in and pull the team together and this is kind of a goofy terminology, but no, not really. Let them know that I'm an ally, right? I have I have a role and responsibility. I have things I'm responsible for, but at the same time, it's in all of our best interest for all of us to be on the same page. And so one of the biggest gaps that I've experienced is it's kind of twofold. It's it's a broad brush of maybe an SOW or KPIs for a, a, a specific customer. We'll say Google, for instance, right? There are <laughs> multiple types of buildings and, and multiple um, um, SOWs that need to be had for a specific place. But oftentimes, especially when you're working with an RFP, even though they'll have little breakouts of, okay, lab space, this is the uh, SOP for the lab space, and this is the SOP for the cafeteria, SOP, SOW, um, you really need to look at those and get on site and listen to your team. Because if, if you're already if you're already performing at the site now if you're not performing at the site obviously you need to fall back on your your industry knowledge et cetera and, and past experiences but um, listening to okay hey you know we are doing this space I understand the SW is telling us we need to do this however here are the the circumstances that actually exist within this space and so incorporating that right and so that does two things number one you're getting your team to understand okay yeah really this person really does care, right? They're not just coming in as a new boss and trying to say, oh, it's all my way or the highway, et cetera. But also you have an opportunity when you're in that proposal, um, when you're sitting in front of the customer to gently educate them on what their facility actually needs. And I think a lot of companies say that's what they do, but when the rubber meets the road, oftentimes uh, it, that's not necessarily what happens, right? Because it, it, it can almost come off as adversarial or it can almost come off as, oh, we're just looking for more money. But in the reality, you know what you need to do to perform in those spaces. And so to be a long-term customer and, and partner, you need to be able to have that openness and conversation with them. So that, that I would say would be one of the gaps. The other gap is just communication in general, especially over a large, um, uh, you know, a large team or a large area, succinct, clear communication with very clear goals and steps on how to get there. But then also the listening piece back. I, I, I you know, you see all these, um, I guess you would call them memes and, and things on LinkedIn or, or Facebook about leadership and leadership is listening and leadership is this and that. But I think, I think oftentimes, um, 
when you're so busy and you have so much responsibility on your shoulders, it, everybody for that matter, right? The communication can really break down. And as soon as communication breaks down, um, you know, the ship starts falling apart and uh, that turns into an issue. And so, and then again, that comes into the morale piece. And again, I'm, I'm hitting on that again, but to me, it's huge, right? I, the morale piece, um, because it can be very uncertain and scary, especially if you're, let's say, the account manager for a Google, and there's a potential to lose this site. And so you're going, my goodness, why am I going to put in all this effort if I'm potentially not even going to have a job? And, and, and then you aren't able to garner some of those really key bits of information that are the, the differentiators when you're setting in those proposal moments. Because again, that's another thing that, you know, you're coming to a proposal, it's what are our key differentiators, right? Why are we different than the 50 other uh, cleaning companies that are out there or, or facilities companies, et cetera? Um, and so there's, there's so, I know I'm kind of getting all over the place, but there's so much oh, when you sit great. down. And so it's trying to just break it apart and understand that even though many opportunities are similar, none of them are the exact same, even if it's the same customer in a different building. And, and even, you know, the same uh, facilities manager that you're, you're uh, speaking with or the procurement folks, which, and then getting into the procurement side of it, my goodness, right? When you're doing a proposal, understanding how to translate that information into knowledge that the procurement folks are going to go, ah, yeah, that, that's why we want to pick them, right? And a lot of that comes to relationship, but there's just, there's so many, there's so many facets to, to making sure you have a, a solid uh, value proposition so that you're securing the business. I was all over the place, wasn't I? No, no, that, I mean, listen, these national accounts require a lot of different areas of focus and expertise. So your answer makes a ton of sense when you put it all together. I actually have two questions on that. And this is one from my own curiosity. And I believe uh, I, I just know with confidence, someone listening to this, even if they run an awesome $10 million janitorial company, they might think like, okay, what's the next level hmm. look like? So someone like you with your experience I'm just curious, like, let's say, let's say you have a 20 building portfolio account, you hold the relationship, it's time for a renewal. What's the bidding process look like? Like, and I'm, I'm genuinely curious and my listeners might laugh because I don't know, like, are you the one doing the bidding? Are you relying on your ops guy? Are you guys teaming up together? Like, how do you guys get that number to give to the client? And then ultimately you as the account manager, are you also the one kind of closing the deal? Do you bring in a biz dev person? Talk to me about the dynamics of, of what that all looks like. Yeah, that's, that's another awesome question. I mean, so as a very quick answer, it, it varies, right? It varies by situation. It varies by who has the relationship. So it, in an instance where I would be bidding on, let's say, your exact circumstances, right? I definitely... I've always wanted to be involved in the bid process. And that's only, especially from an operation side. And, you know, the biz development guys are, are awesome guys and gals. I've worked with some incredible business development folks. But at the same time, they don't live the, the life of the operations folks that are at the site. And, and, and even though they may speak some of the, 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 the language, they don't maybe necessarily have the specific language for that specific site. And so, again, it, it's pulling in a team. I, this is kind of a goofy, a goofy phrase that I use, but it's basically hire to be fired. And what I mean is just hire folks way smarter than you. And, and if they take their job, hopefully they'll, they'll take you along or something, you know, but, but having folks on there that know through and through, cause I, I've had some great opportunity and, and, and I've gotten to be a part of a lot of really fantastic projects and, and different types of facilities from, you know, hospitals and pharma to, you know, the industrial manufacturing, et cetera, but I'm not a, an expert on this one specific process for this one specific site. Like for instance, we had a case tractors site out in uh, Racine and I had a gentleman at site. They were doing um, cleanouts of the pits for all the oil. And, and then they actually ended up getting into actually servicing um, some of the, uh, the, the mills and, and lathes and, and things of that nature that they were using in the spaces. Right. So that's kind of, an opportunity to grow. And so when I get back to your, your question, I've always liked to be involved just because number one, if 
ultimately the account is going to roll up under me. I want to know what's happened from start to finish. I want to be a part of the conversation so that I'm not caught off guard if asked a specific question from the customer. Um, the other piece though, is the, you know, having an account manager, if you have an account manager that runs the site, absolutely instrumental in having that person very involved in the entirety of the, the process. And oftentimes, you know, folks want a little bit of separation for maybe those account managers not to have visibility into all the financial aspects of it, which is okay, right? You can pull certain parts out, but to manage a site and an account or a region properly, you have to have visibility into the financials, but you have to have an understanding of what the goals are as well, right? Your financial goals. And so I think teaching or teaching is, is the wrong phrase, but allowing folks visibility into that so that they can also understand as you're putting this proposal together, what, you know, what the end result is going to be. And then certainly having business development folks involved. Um, if Again, if it's an existing account, relationship is huge. And then understanding complacency is a killer, right? And so if you're, if you're maybe not, if you kind of have, have blinders on because the relationship is so great that you think, oh my goodness, we'll never lose this. I've had accounts where we've lost them because of that specific reason. It's like, no, our, our relationship is amazing. We'll never lose this. You know, yeah, we might be a little high in these spaces and, and, you know, the restrooms have been getting dinged quite a bit, but you know, they love us. They'll never get rid of us. And, and lo and behold, somebody comes in and, and we lose the site. So relationship is huge, but also looking at every opportunity as a new opportunity, meaning every opportunity is a new customer. All right. Hang with me for the next minute and a half. We got a quick break here in the Profitable Cleaner because we're officially official. It's like I like to say it. Why? Because I get to take this break and introduce our sponsors. First sponsors is Usource. So go to usource.com. That's U-S-O-U-R-C-E.com. This is a business management platform for facility services company. No more chaos, unnecessary admin work, or just having to consolidate information. This is about you, you not being the source of information anymore and having a platform that can give you accessibility, visibility, and control over your operation. So see more, do more, whether you're one employee or 3,000 employees, this is the platform for you. So check out our sponsor, usource.com. Our second sponsor, dayporter.com. They will help you with all your outbound, LinkedIn, email, call, and they're going to do it with a team from Latin America. So make sure that that you reach out to them, dayporter.com. They can help you hire your next superstar and give you the strategies to go book the walkthroughs that you're looking for. The th third one is going to be Melgar Consulting. That's alexmelgar.com. If you're hovering around the $5 million range and you're in the facility services industry, want to hit those 20, want to keep bumping your head and really want to scale, he is going to be able to consult and help you have the right foundation, the right structure, and the right strategies, and the right advisory and consulting to get you past those 5 to 20 million. So go to alexmelgard.com. And last but not least, our fourth sponsor, cleaningprofits.com. That is our annual event for facility services, CEO, executive teams, leadership teams. Bring them out. This is all about transformation. It's all about training. It's all about community. And it's held once a year, this year, September 12th to the 14th. So thank you once again to all of our sponsors. And let's continue on to the show. Love it. I love it. I think that's a well-said answer. Okay. Along those lines, let's talk about loss. So you talked about having such a strong relationship. You never think you'll lose the account. And then all of a sudden, you're unfortunately surprised with bad news. When you do lose a big account at the national level, what do you do after you lose that account? Like, it, like how do you manage that post-loss relationship with the client? Mm. Do you continue to try to, I don't want to say resell, but stay in front of that client to hopefully get a chance to rekindle that relationship? Talk to me about the, the post-game press conference after you lose a big account. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, what a hard, what a hard thing to go through, right? I think anybody who's been in the industry for, for even a short period of time has experienced that. Um, and that can be, my goodness, it just takes a sale out of your wins, especially if you feel that we had this amazing relationship and why 
why, why would they do this? And so I would say the biggest thing is to lose with grace and to maintain your professionalism throughout, even if, even if you feel that the reasons were so ridiculous and minuscule to you, maybe, right? But perspective is everything. And so from somebody else, maybe, maybe those were life-changing. And maybe you don't know what was really going on because the relationship wasn't as great as you thought it was. So not taking those relationships for granted, I think, is, is huge. Um, I'm going to be goofy for a minute here. But my mom, when I was growing up, my mom always told me, you know, when you get married, you've got to find a new way to show your wife you love her every day. And it's right. And so that translates to me into, man, that was goofy. But what I'm trying to get to is that even with a customer, a longstanding customer, it's finding new ways to show your value. And I was just having a, uh, uh, just had a, uh, a meeting with my team about this. And that was, you know, we're working within a certain realm. And I, <clears throat> I promise I'll get back to your specific question. I get off on all these tangents sometimes. No, this right? is but great, man. Um, but, you know, you're working within a specific realm in, in, of our scope of work or, you know, these are the KPIs we have to meet. Right. And so we're so focused on those, but taking the time to step back, take a deep breath, right? Grab a cup of coffee and look at how else can I be of value to this customer? And so that comes back into, you know, the, the, after you've lost a large account, showing character in, in the sense of still being professional, still being open, still being uh, friendly with that customer and, and 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 you know this is almost counterintuitive sometimes i think folks say because you never want to admit um uh, faults or whatever it's a bad way to put it but i just i don't agree with that in any way shape or form right we're all human and i think especially when when you have an opportunity to start working your way up in in the chain of command for lack of a better term it's like no i you know folks want to project i'm i'm such a i know everything maybe not necessarily i know everything but you know, I, I, I don't make mistakes or whatever. And, and I, I've always found I'm the biggest goofball on earth, to be honest with you. Like I make mistakes all the time. Right. And so to be able to admit up, admit that and own up to it, I think that strikes a chord with folks, especially after you've maybe lost an account. So they, they understand, okay, this is a real person I'm, I'm dealing with, right? We're doing business dollars and cents. It all matters. Um, but I know I have a true partner in this because at least they're honest with me. And then that almost goes back into not almost that that comes into play with, you know, what we were talking about earlier with um, looking at an SW and saying, hey, you know what, this is great in these areas, but I think you guys need to, to change this. Now, if you're talking to, to procurement folks about that, um, that can be the end of the world, right? Because putting an RFP together is unbelievably difficult, especially it's if it's work. a large especially if it's a large um, portfolio. So just that openness and honesty, I think is, is huge. It's, it's hugely important. And more often than not, you'll find that you'll have the opportunity again. That's one thing about this business and the business we're in is that sometimes it can be a round robin, right? The, the door is just continually opening and closing, opening and closing. And you never know who, where that may take you and those relationships may take you. Even if you lost an account, they say, hey, you know what? Uh, I know my friend Joe over at this site. Uh, they're looking for a new a new provider, and you've been amazing. And 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 I've had that happen actually, not on on a large scale, but but losing an account and having a good relationship with the gentleman that ran the account. And I was I was a much younger man, um, and and getting an opportunity at another site. You know, it's just uh, I think I think the losing with grace to wrap that all up into a package. I think is is hugely important in my opinion. I think that's really well said, man. And I've had it too, where like you can lose an account in any realm of sale. And then that decision maker can't, you lose that sale because of budget, because of mistakes. It doesn't matter, but you still lose with grace. You hold that relationship. That decision maker can move on somewhere else. And guess what? You're going to be a contact to hopefully set that person up to look like a superhero with that new account and that new position they're in. So I really think that's well said, lose with grace. So I want to kind of switch the, switch the conversation to leadership. 
because it seems like mm-hmm. you're really big into leadership. You've talked about the importance of camaraderie, your team. I'm going to do something I've never done on this show, Niles, just for you, because I think this is cool. Oh, People can talk a lot about leadership, but the proof's in the pudding. So we're going to play a little game here. There's something out there online that says Niles is a detail-oriented manager that has the ability to manage customers and employee relationships at a commendable level. Niles was able to build a strong team, both internal and external, uh, with customers through his effective communication skills and relationship. I was so impressed with Niles as a mentor and boss that I've worked under him in with two different companies. And then he goes on to say a few more nice things. Who do you think that was? Do you have any idea who wrote that about you? Robert Portera. Absolutely right. And was it? You you passed that test. I I put you on the spot there. One that was a LinkedIn recommendation for you. And I thought that was a very heartfelt and there's plenty of others that said many great things. But a few things stood out to me and Robert's message to you is one, he followed you in multiple job locations. Um, people follow leaders. That's the whole, you you lead, people follow. And then I wanted to kind of put you on the spot to see how well you knew the people you've impacted and, and you passed that test. So I'm glad you passed that test. It would have been a little awkward if you didn't. Um, <laughs> Talk to me about leadership, man. At, at this level, it seems like you've put a big emphasis on it. And I think a lot of times, especially in corporate national accounts, leadership gets overlooked. It's this is how we do things. This is this is how it's expected to be done. You are, seems like you're very person to person, even with large scale teams of 500 plus people that I've see, seen you've managed. How do you keep that interpersonal touch with your people? And just talk to me about some leadership principles you possess. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, honestly, this has always been kind of a, a, a difficult one for me. It's, you know, even when, when you interview, it, it's hard to talk about yourself, right? Because, I, because then you feel like, oh, my goodness, I'm being pretentious or and so trying to especially. But you have to be able to kind of go through your accomplishments, I, I suppose. I. So, boy, how do I wrap this up? So, number one, Robert Porter is an amazing, amazing guy. Um, he and I, way back at Capital Building Services, years and years and years ago, is when we started working together. I was a district manager, and I oversaw everything. In, um, uh, and, and there were retail accounts. And retail, my goodness, that, that line of business is so difficult, um, it, you know. But we were we were getting up together, cleaning Macy's stores at four a.m. before opening, and and trying to get the racetrack at some of these targets ready. You know, doing a a shut in the night over and stuff like. This. I mean, he was just he was a warrior. He was a soldier. He got out, and, and his team um, loved him to death. And so we were able to pull a lot of stuff together. But I think you know that goes back to earlier in our conversation. I I, I think that especially have, as you have an opportunity to work your way up in, in a chain of command, it can be very easy to stop um, fostering those relationships because there is an unbelievable amount of pressure from the top down also, right? To manage the financials, to, to you know, manage your productivity, which, which at the end of the day, it all comes back to dollars and cents, right? And, so, and that's a, it's a very important part of business because if you're not managing your budget budget properly, then you don't have a business. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the uh, ales for for companies can be worked through by making sure that your team and the boots on the ground understand the vision, are a part of the vision, right? Have bought into the vision and want the company to be as successful as you do. And the only way that you do that is through that interaction. And through leading a team through the great stuff and rewarding the great stuff, I think it's hugely important. You know, <laughs> pay rates are important. They're not everything in any way, shape, or form. Um, tchotchkes are great, but they don't make people want to work a whole lot harder, right? And so where do you find that bridge in the middle that it really brings people on board <clears throat> to your vision? And I think it's authenticity. And it's it's being... Uh, um, transparent, as transparent as you can be about certain things with your team, 
when things stink and everyone's in the gutter and we're trying to work through something very difficult and hey, well, we're, we might lose this account and we might all be out of a job. How do you find the, 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 the ability to pull everyone together and keep pushing just as hard, if not harder, to maintain your employment and to maintain the lifestyle that they've built and you've built, et cetera. And so I think that, again, that comes back, I'm all over the place again. This, this one, I don't know, it strikes a chord with me. I've worked for folks that, I've worked for bosses that have been um, amazing bosses and, and taught me so much. And not only that, but gave me opportunities that I didn't deserve at the time, quite frankly, you know, to be, to be totally honest. It's like, you know, being a young man and um, I had an opportunity to oversee several states and I was still relatively fresh in certain things. And it's like, okay, you're going to go out there and you're su going to succeed or fail. But then the leader that allowed me that opportunity came alongside and really showed me, um, number one, what I was doing wrong, but what I was doing right. Not just focusing on one or the other. It's such a, it has to be balanced. And so I guess principles of leadership that I look at or things that I want to, to emulate are things that I've garnered from um, a lot of great bosses that I've worked for and things that I don't want to uh, uh, emulate are things that I've seen or, or been uh, a recipient of from folks that, you know, just weren't, <laughs> weren't great people at the time, I suppose, for, for lack of a better uh, way to put that. Um, I think auth authenticity is huge. Okay. And no. on a, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say no doubt about it. I think authenticity is, often overlooked in leadership. And we've had a lot of leadership talks on this exact podcast and mm -hmm. only leadership coaches have brought up authenticity. So it, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting that you're bringing that up and then only leadership coaches that we've had on here specifically. So I'm in agreement with you, man. I think it's awesome. What, what What's your authentic style? What would you say makes you authentic? I So... I apologize. My mouth's getting dry. I got to take no, a quick no, do, of coffee. Do your thing, man. I think this is a great conversation. A lot of people if, are if scared I'm to show their authenticity. Much, if I'm talking too much, just knock me on the head and say, "Hey, hey, calm down." Maybe I've no, had you're too good, much man. I, I want to extract all this, all, all the juice that I can from you, man. So, someone like you that you just spoke about authenticity, you go go on this man's LinkedIn, guys. You'll see what I'm talking about in terms of people who have recommended him. And what he's been able to accomplish, but I guess I'll ask you directly, Niles. What makes you authentic as a leader? I think so. It's changed over time. It, 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 it especially as a younger man, there are certain frameworks that you think you have to fit within to be a leader and to achieve these these grandiose goals that everyone posts on Facebook or, or LinkedIn. And I don't, I don't say that negatively in any way, shape or form, right? Those are things that we all look to achieve to a certain degree, right? Um, but then as you, you have an opportunity to achieve some of these, these milestones, at least for myself, I, you know, you look back and you go, even though this is awesome, it's, it's not necessarily what I thought it was. Right. And so, and so you don't, you don't necessarily have to fit a certain mold to be a good leader, right? It's, it's in my opinion, it's all about relationships and it's about just being who you are. I'm, I'm a goofball, right? I'm, I'm kind of, a, kind of a, a, a goofy guy in the sense that, you know, I don't, I don't fit all of the, um, the, the, the specific, boy, what is the word I'm looking for here? Well, you, you can just see from our interview, right? I'm, I'm not necessarily, I'm very animated. I'm very, um, uh, very outspoken, and I just like to be straightforward about certain things. But, but you know, there's that phrase, you know, season your words with salt. And so, just because you are being, uh, uh, maybe speaking about things that aren't aren't necessarily happy things, that doesn't mean that you have to come down on somebody so hard that they feel completely worthless and and demoralized because then you're not building them up. And it, again, it goes back to uh, what I had said earlier and that's hired to be fired, which another way to really look at that is just succession planning. And so imparting any bit of knowledge, not necessarily just from yourself, but op you know, opportunities for learning, opportunities to get out there and be in front of the customer in situations that maybe your team hasn't had an opportunity to do. Because it's that, that age old thing, right? Where 
you know, the job says I need, I need experience, but then, well, where the heck do I get the experience? And so if we don't offer our team those opportunities to gain that experience and then get insight from them, because everybody has different life lessons, everybody has different perspectives on things. So pulling those in just makes you that much more of a comprehensive leader, right? And so I think, I think especially as myself as a younger man, I was insecure to a certain degree of those folks when I'm managing folks that were, that were older than me, but they had so much knowledge or even maybe somebody that, that was younger than me, than me, but was just an absolute genius. And so maybe I didn't rely or, or, or lean on that specific information enough and, and that ends up hurting you. So I, I, you know, when I say authenticity, I, I suppose I just mean, don't be embarrassed if you're a little bit of a goofball like me, right? And just look to, to have good relationships and strong relationships, but also at the same time, Strict, ah, strict parameters is the wrong word, but understand, I think this is one of the other things and I'll, and I'll be quiet here, but if you're going to be an authentic person in leadership, you're going to get stabbed in the back. It's just going to happen. And because not everybody has the same um, goals or mindset and um, folks are going to say bad stuff about you. It just happens, right? It happens in life and that can I've had that happen on, on a couple of occasions and, you know, it hurts and you go, my goodness, I was really trying to be, I was trying to be helpful. I was trying to, you know, do the right thing, et cetera. And so expect for that to happen from time to time, but don't let it stop you from continuing to be the person that you're being and, and helping folks along the way and understanding that just because you hold a higher position at the end of the day, it doesn't mean squat, right? And what I mean by that is we're all humans. And so if you're not treating people as equals, then then there's no way you can be authentic because you're already starting, you know, with the wrong perspective, I suppose. That was such an all over the place answer. It just that, I don't know, I'm very passionate about that because I feel that, especially in today's day and age, we've got to be, we have to start pulling folks together. We have to be, uh, uh, um, I guess a team for lack of a better term. And the only way to do that is, is allowing yourself to be a little bit vulnerable because if you're, if you're not vulnerable, then, um, then you're not truly being authentic in my opinion. I think that's awesome, man. I think that's a wonderful answer mainly because I, I know like me coming into this conversation, right? We all have preconceived notions of, what leaders are, and then even like what positions you have in leadership. So like someone like you, national account manager, you've worked for the big national brands, you worked for the big dogs, right? I'm, I'm more of the, the gritty entrepreneur. Um, I don't want to say small time guy, but we live in two different worlds in terms of like, like, uh, sales that we deal with and accounts that, that, I'm used to versus someone like you might be used to. So I come into this preconceived notion of like corporate leadership model versus the, the mm -hmm. gritty entrepreneur leadership model. And really it's actually not where aligned because leadership's leadership. So I love that answer. I think it humanizes uh, someone that that's been at the national level. That's ran very large teams. I have two last questions for you, my man. And this is, I mean, we could do, we're probably going to have to do a second episode with Angel on this because I think he's going to have a ton of questions for someone like you. But I'm going to keep my first question more operational and tactical focused. Okay. So sounds like you're big on operational excellence. When you deal with multi-state accounts, national accounts, different locations, you have to, operational excellence has to be part mm -hmm. of your core embodiment. How does how does a big scale national account? What are the KPIs you track to keep that operational excellence? I'm just curious mm -hmm. from someone that's seen what you've seen, and what are those KPIs that you're looking for, and how do you know when an account is at that operational peak outside of the client just renewing? Yeah, yes. I, what an awesome question. And, and very quickly to backtrack. So I I agree with you in that. So the entrepreneurial I think what I've done is is vastly easier than what you've done, and you're you're incredibly successful, right? Your whole team. I I I, I did a lot of reading of, like I said, Sophia was awesome. I got a, a great chance to talk to her. I was, I was super bummed, 
I didn't make the event, but I, I, I will definitely make it. But I guess the point I'm trying to get to is your, what you're doing is you've, you've created something out of nothing, literally, right? There, there was no roadmap for you to get to where you're at. And, and you have a very successful podcast and, and you know, you're running events and, and you're pulling all this stuff together, not, you know, maybe not have gone through the industry the, in the same, the same trajectory. Like, yeah, that is a thing that I would say you, you can never down, down, downplay in any way, shape or form. I, I think it's, it's so much harder than, than, you know, folks that have come through the ranks in, in, in the industry. It's, I think you have a lot more knowledge that you can impart on folks that really have been, uh, uh, you know, in this industry and kind of work their way through it. So appreciate that, brother. I got a point there, but I, I just, I think it's a really, I think it's a really neat um, point. So KPIs, let's see here. So, boy, again, it really depends on, I, I think the key point is that no situation is cookie cutter, right? You can't broad brush anything. And so depending on the type of account that you're working at, um, continuous improvement is, is hugely important. And so I think it's setting your gaze above the horizon. And what I mean by that is, you, you know, you can't just focus on this one thing, right? So we have KPIs that are very important. Um, I think a, a big part of that is standardization. But then again, you can't just focus only on standardization. What I mean by that is a project that I, that I was working on a couple of years back, as I said, oh, you know what? We're just going to standardize our SWs across, across the board for this specific type of account. But you can't do that because in state A, you have a workforce that is accustomed to a certain productivity rate and certain processes and procedures. You move into state B and they're all coming from out of area, right? And so you have to add more time for those, you know, standard standard tasks, et cetera, and, and being able to pull the team together. And so, I, you know, labor, I think watching your labor is hugely important, uh, specifically for janitorial, <clears throat> when you're setting up runs looking at everything that's involved, right? So what is it? Several years ago, um, it was all about the team clean model, right? And so we're going to do a team clean. We have a vacuum specialist. We have this. And when it first came out, everyone's like, oh, this is amazing. This is going to change things. And, and it really is good in certain circumstances, but it's not great in all circumstances. You have to move back to kind of a zone model because uh, uh, if the building is too big or, or you know, you have janitorial closets where you've got one on the 30th floor and one on the first floor and no mop sinks in between. It's like, my goodness, how are we going to do this? So, you know, setting up, setting up your standards properly. So standardization is important. Tools I, are another huge one for me, making sure that your team has the right tools to achieve the goals that you've set out for them to achieve. And that come, goes from, you know, the, the, uh, you know, mops or, or scrubbers and things of that nature, but also the technology side, um, which also moves into, so the funny thing about the technology side is I love the technology side when it comes to reporting and um, uh, validation of tasks, et cetera. Um, but I found that when you have specific, you know, the boots on the ground folks that are moving a thousand miles an hour, they don't always have time to look at a, a phone and, and go check, 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 done, or scan a barcode and say, oh, done, 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 right? And so if you're not incorporating the amount of time that it takes out of their productive day, productive day, forgive me, then you're running into trouble. And so I feel like I get in the weeds so much, forgive me, to back up. No, dude, it, this is awesome. It's, it's, very, it's a very comprehensive equation for each circumstance, in my opinion. There's a lot of amazing standards that, that get you 70% of the way, but don't take that for granted. You really have to look at everything in, in your workforce and their ability to, to get out and get certain things done and the feasibility of the scope of work in general. Again, that comes back to a conversation with a customer if it's, if it's completely impossible. I feel like I really flubbed that one. My brain goes into, uh, you know, I just all this stuff floating around, my goodness. So I get a little long winded. I'm sorry. No, no, not long winded at all. I mean, national accounts are complex. And so having standard KPIs across the board, like the broad brush stroke you talked about doesn't make sense. But I do think like myself, I know I, I wonder what like large scale national account KPIs would be like, but I know people listening here, they're on that teetering edge of, Hey, do mm -hmm. I expand multi-state? Do I expand 
uh, I know I have this chain of retail stores in Texas. Do I expand that to Oklahoma? Right. Like, so Mm -hmm. I think these are important conversations to have, which is why I think we need to have a conversation 2.0 with my, my partner at another time, Angel on this, because he would dive deep with you, man. But I'll tell you this, Niles, how we always end the show and your insight and your authenticity has been invaluable, man. Truly appreciate it. But we always end the show with a question roulette. I have this little white box here. I have no idea what's in these questions. Anything can come out. Um, Once we ask a question once on the show, we never ask it again. Are you willing to play? I'm, I'm ready and willing. A little nervous, but ready and willing. Okay. All right. So question. (laughs) Fourth, <laughs> yeah, all right. I love this one. What is your morning inspirational pep talk? <laughs> oh goodness! Well, I've never been a morning person, um, uh, so my morning pep talk really is uh, get coffee, get the coffee going, and just be thankful for what I have. Quite frankly, uh, I do a quick prayer and and. Um, but if I don't get coffee in me, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Nice. So, are you, are you, like a, are, are, are you like a coffee all day drinker or just a morning, morning coffee guy? I, I used to drink a lot more throughout the day, but, um, again, as you get older, it, it starts affecting you differently and I get jitters. So, I mean, I usually drink it until probably two, two thirty, And then, then I start hitting a lot of the sparkling water, which I have all my sparkling water with me because yeah nice nice love it love it well niles i can't thank you enough man uh just for your willingness to come share your knowledge uh give us some of your authenticity which i thought was awesome and uh definitely need a second conversation around this and i'm going to go ahead and tentatively pencil you in for cleaning profits 3.0 because one i love i think you would love the community that has been harnessed there but two i know people would get i I think you'd learn a lot from a lot of these awesome companies that are there, but more than that, I think you also have a lot to bring to a lot of these companies there. And, and it's a cool group. It's, it's a fun, engaged group and a little bit different than probably what your, what the other industry events out there are like. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and bookmark that now on, on recording while I have you and then let Sophia re-listen to this and call you next September. So I appreciate it, man. You. Yeah. Awesome. I love it, man. Um, we're going to go ahead. If you guys are curious on how to one, learn more about, uh, Niles and, uh, want to connect with him, he's going to be linked up, uh, through his LinkedIn with the show notes below and Niles. Thank you again so much, brother. And can't wait for, uh, our follow-up conversation. Yeah. Thank Hey, thank you. Thank you for, you know, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to have the conversation and this has been awesome. I mean, I, I've really enjoyed it and yeah, I'm, I'm hundred percent there for the next event. I, I was super bummed so that I didn't make it last time. Awesome, man. We'll talk to you here soon. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Take care.